Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Once again, um, hope you all are doing well. Um, I'm sure more, of, um, more will join in as we, as we go on. Uh, but yeah, uh, can I request uh, someone to just lead us in a word of prayer, please, here before we go ahead and start? Anybody? Please, please lead us. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Lord, we submit us as a class to your mighty presence. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak to us, help us to understand the authority that you have given us. Or we pray that even as we continue in the works that you have appointed for us, we would be able to minister to people as you have ministered to people, God. And uh, we also pray for Pastor Roshan, strengthen him to deliver your word to us, God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, John. Let me go ahead and share the screen. Great, um, you all can see. I just want to do a quick recap of uh, chapter one and chapter two very quickly. So we're just going to look at the titles of all the pages of the words we finished. Uh, two chapters, uh, including the introduction. And from the very beginning of this course, uh, we've seen that this course is all about uh, evangelism, the Jesus way, the way he lived life, and a calling to each and every one of us an encouragement that every believer can do this well, because of the sonship glory that's been given to us as well and also with the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power, same Holy Spirit that worked through Jesus is available for us. Right? So that's the basis of an introduction. And in chapter one, we looked at why miracles, healings, and deliverance. Uh, we looked at eight different uh, points for that, right? We see that miracles, healing, and deliverance reveal the reality and nature of God. It reveals miracles reveal God's greatness and demonstrate His compassion. Uh, the importance Jesus gave to miracles, uh, which we will learn a bit more uh, in today's chapter, chapter three, as we look into it. And uh, the kingdom that comes with power as we minister and healing and deliverance, and so on, right? So. Those are some of the key points that we learned in chapter one. And, and, um, and some of the questions like, okay, don't demonic powers also demonstrate the supernatural? We look at, is asking for signs wrong? Um, right? There's a lot of important things that was covered in chapter one. And in chapter two, we just keep going deeper. The foundations keep going deeper and deeper for, for, for understanding to be strong, for uh, to build our ministry on it, with the foundations need to be super strong. So that's what chapter one and chapter two are dealing with, right? Um, and again, we see the source of sickness, disease, and ailments, uh, and does God send sickness? And the answer to that is clearly no, an emphatic no. Uh, and then we see a list of bases for ministering, healing, and deliverance. Right? We see that it is his nature as who he is and because of his cross and the cross is made available for everyone right? everyone the salvation is made available for everyone uh, his word right his word is truth and we see that the power of the holy spirit um and and understanding the power in the name of jesus functioning and working and walking um out of that authority um in the you know, moving in the name of Jesus and by faith, understanding the kingdom of God, uh, the king and his dominion. What is it? What is that all about? And then one of the last bases for ministering and healing and deliverance is um, it's also a commission. We have been commissioned or co-mission, co-labor, right? Uh, so we are partnering with God on this. Um, because that is his heart, that is his vision, right? That's his nature to see his children be made whole, like his original design. 
right? Because of sin, we've all deviated from the original design. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, right? Um, and then we see this important question, is it God's will to heal everyone? Right? It's not a tricky question. Um, it's clearly, again, once again, an emphatic, you know, it is God's will to heal everyone. That is his desire. It's his nature. Right? Um, and so understanding that, is it right to pray, if, if it be thy will, uh, let this person be healed. You know, when we give an altar call, uh, when, people, when a sinner wants to give his life to Jesus, we don't pray and say, well, if it is your will, let this person be saved. Uh, you, you know? But the prayer is already being answered. The, you know, Jesus died on the cross. That is the answer for the sinner. So and similarly, when it comes to healing, we already know the heart of the Father for the sick. Right? So again, the answer to that question is we don't have to, we don't need to. And then uh, some of uh, the questions that were addressed in chapter 2 as a conclusion was, why doesn't everyone... Uh, get healed? Why are some healings gradual? Why are some healings partial and not complete? Uh, and the three attitudes uh, <clears throat> that allow God to do miracles and see the faith, expectancy, and intense desires are some of the three uh, core uh, heart attitudes that allow God to work miracles. Okay? Uh, we must expect people to get well. We need to help them to come to a place of faith, expectancy, and have intense desire to be made whole. Okay. And then in conclusion, we saw uh, a, list, uh, a list that uh, can hinder, uh, you know, in receiving healing. Another thing is lack of knowledge um, is from Hosea 4, 6 and Isaiah 5, 13, uh, which we saw last week. Uh, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish uh, because of lack of knowledge. In Isaiah 5, 13, it simply says, uh, due to the lack of understanding, my people have been taken into captivity or exile. Right? Um, so, and then there's a list of points mentioned there. So uh, this is where we concluded um, so far in this course, Ministering Divine Healing, right? Uh, is we built on some of the most uh, core points trying to answer some of the important questions or frequently asked questions. Um, but and we will we are going to address more questions related uh, to healing and deliverance uh, in the chapter to come. Okay, all right. So and uh, I really hope that you make that you are able to make time and uh, you know, and read uh, some of some of the portions of this uh, content uh, in, you know, whenever you can, just to revise or I can, you know, summarize um, for yourself. Okay, so that was just a quick summary. I hope everybody's with me. And uh, for those of you who joined a little late, um, this is a Roshan's friend brother. Okay. Okay, cool. uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Oh, okay. So today we are going to look at chapter three. Chapter three is the father's works. Okay. Um, Lord Jesus came to do the works of the father. We know that in everything that Jesus did, uh, you know, we, we see that he came to reveal the father. He, he, he did certain things because the father told him to do so, and he is, and he is going to keep quoting that time and time again. Um, excuse me, I'm to put my phone on airplane mode, so I don't get distracted. Apologies. Um, something else. Sorry, guys. Okay, so uh, the Lord Jesus came to do the works of the Father. He said that he had to be about the Father's business. Okay, uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, um, 
just paste that in the chat section. Luke 2, 49, um, it says, and he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Um, and some of scriptures from the passage from John chapter 5, verse 43, he says, I have come in my father's name, and you do not receive me. If, an, if another comes in his own name, you will receive. Okay, I have come in my father's name. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness with me. Another scripture mentioned in the passage is Hebrews 10 verse 5 to 7. It says, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Okay. Uh, and some more scriptures in John chapter 2, verse 16. <clears throat> he said to those who, uh, who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Okay, um, so let's see what, what uh, what's the pastor saying? So he said that he he had to be about the father's business. Right? We see that he mentions, and he came to do the father's will. That's Hebrews ten five seven. Right? He came in the father's name. That's representing the purpose and intent of the father. He came in the name of the father. He came to, he was an ambassador, the father's ambassador. He came to reveal the father. He came in his authority. He revealed sonship glory as of the only begotten of the father. He called it, he called the temple, my father's house. And he demonstrated that healings were to be carried out in the father's house. Okay. And in Matthew 21, let me put it in. Um, share that with us. In Matthew 21, 12 and 14, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of, of, of temple of God and drew out all those who, had, who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the mouth changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Right, in, um, in conclusion, one of the last verses, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, we also see that he came to destroy the works of the devil. Right, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil and that he might destroy the works of the devil Okay, so let's now, uh, with all of these scriptures in mind, uh, let's just re uh, read that passage one more time. So, you know, because now that we've read the scriptures, uh, let you know, we might understand it a little differently. So he said that he had to be about the father's business and he came to do the father's work. He came in the father's name. He called his temple the father's house. Right, And in all doing so, in everything that he did, he came to destroy the works of the devil, I mentioned in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Okay, so it was like Jesus was like a man on a mission. He was almost like, you know, just like a one-man army. He was a man on a uh, you know, mission. He had just this one thing, like do the will of the Father, do the will of the Father. Do the will. It's almost like, um, like a soldier type mentality kind of thing, you know. Um, 
uh, if you've seen any of the war movies, uh, you know, I like war movies, uh, not, to, you know, not that I like that how people were killed or destroyed, uh, you know, the brutality of the war. No, it's just like the history behind it, just so, uh, you know, there's so much to learn, isn't it? But one of the uh, interesting of oh, one of the fighters of the war that I like is uh, snipers. Right. If you know anything about the scout snipers, what they do is, you know, they hide themselves in the bushes or, you know, they make kind of camouflage themselves. And uh, so the enemy cannot identify where they are at. And so there's just a story of one of the snipers, right, that he crawled for almost five days, you know, Without, I don't know if he had anything to eat or not, but it's a, it's based on a real story. He would crawl in the five days to take off the tar- to take off the target. He was just fixed on that one goal, right? That means that he had to endure the weather, the rain, the sun. Um, and this happened during the Vietnam War uh, in the seventies, and uh, the terrain is not friendly. But for, for a person, for a soldier to just be fixed on his goal, his mission, his vision, that, okay, I have to do this for my country. Or for, I have to defend my people. And so he goes ahead and do, does that. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like that, isn't it? Like, yeah, just one single focus. One, this is my goal. This is what I'm here to do. And in conclusion, we see one John chapter 3 verse, that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And how he did he did that by you know, displaying and revealing the love of the Father to the people, right? And in the same way, we are called to do the Father's work. Okay, we are called to do the Father's work. Okay, wherever you are, with your mics muted, just say to yourself, okay, say, I am called to do the Father's work. Say it. I believe you. <laughs> so um, our goal in this chapter is to learn what Jesus taught about the Father's work and discover how Jesus walked with the Father to do the, fa- the Father's work. Okay, so that's the goal of this chapter. We're going to see how he walked uh, and how he spoke about his Father and, and, and how he walked with him. Okay, um, so let's go. Are you guys ready to learn more about our Father? Yep. So pardon me if I keep asking questions. This is how I keep the youth. <laughs> All right. So, what Jesus taught about Father's work. Okay. So, time and time again, you know, Jesus was questioned uh, about his uh, uh, about his kingship or about his divinity. Uh, or, you know, are you the Messiah? And time and time again, people have that question, right? Of all the things that Jesus could have pointed to, right? Um, in this passage, we see that the Lord Jesus could have pointed to several supernatural phenomena that surrounded his birth, his life, the ministry to authenticate that he was indeed the Messiah. He could have pointed to the angelic choir that sang to the shepherds at the time of his birth. Imagine that. He could have pointed to the wise men from the east who followed a star and came to visit him. He could have pointed to the dove that descended on him when he was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. He could have pointed to the voice from heaven that occurred at different times. Right? Uh, he could have, I mean, and the list can go on. That's just some of the examples, right? He could have pointed at the Mount of Transfiguration, the, even the thing that happened uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? But instead of pointing at all of those things, you know what Jesus pointed? He pointed to the miracles he did, the healings, deliverance, signs, and wonders. He pointed to them and he said, he called these the Father's works as the evidence of him being the Messiah, right? Everything that he did, in that everything supernatural, the healing and deliverance, he points to them and said, those are the evidence 
for me being the Messiah of everything that he could have pointed at. Isn't that amazing? That's very powerful, isn't it? And if Jesus is doing that, there's 100% a reason behind it, right? It's got to be of great importance if he's doing something, if he's trying to mention something or say something. And then we see a greater witness than John the Baptist. Okay, um, as we read the scriptures, you will understand the context. So uh, John chapter 5, verse 31 to 36, it says, if I, wear, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. It's the same even today in a court of law, isn't it? You can't say, I am the witness of my own self. <laughs> isn't it? Is that just being like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's not going to work, right? Um, verse 32, there is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. It's almost like a tongue twister, brain tease kind of thing, isn't it? You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man. But I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do. Bear witness of me. That the Father has sent me. It's not giving you goosebumps. <laughs> Oh, this is too good, isn't it? Um, the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me. Right? Um, that's amazing. So, following the healing of the crippled man in Jerusalem at the pool of Bethesda, Lord Jesus appointed uh, pointed to the works of the Father as a great, greater witness, the Old Testament prophets. Okay, so this John chapter 5, um, before 31 and 36, the context or the pretext to this text is, is coming after Jesus healing the crippled man in the pool of Bethesda. Right, he's saying, uh, John the Baptist, the greatest Old Testament prophet, prophet pointing to Jesus and declaring him as the Lamb of God was still just the testimony from man. But Jesus said that the Father's work, which he did, which is healing, delivering, working miracles, that is healing, healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, or raising the dead, etc., etc., were a greater witness than John's testimony. Right? So remember, guys, in all of this, Jesus is doing the works of the Father. Right? That's his mission. He's a man on a mission. Right? And then we see, um, we come to a section where John the Baptist kind of has this doubt. Right? We all know this story. Right? Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. It says, Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples. And then he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John heard, had heard in prison about, what, about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor of the gospel have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Okay. John the Baptist. Jesus' cousin. Right. He was Jesus' forerunner. Also known as the friend of the bridegroom. Right? Um, he was sent as a, by God as a forerunner of Jesus to prepare people to receive the Lord. Right. He was the one who saw the dove descending and heard the voice from heaven when he baptized Jesus in the river Jordan. 
He had the unmistakable sign from God pointing Jesus out as the Messiah. It was John who introduced Jesus to the world, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet, sometime later, when John had been apprehended and put in prison, perhaps because of his own predicament, John has doubts about who Jesus really was. Right? Um, and so, in the response, the Lord Jesus pointed to the works of the Father. As evidence, right? It is so. You see that it is interesting that even at this moment, Jesus did not point back to what happened at the River Jordan, right? That we we looked at, right? In, of so many things that Jesus pointed out and said, like, "Bro, come on." First of all, I mean, present times, you know, <laughs> you can ask this question. Come on, you knew me in your mother's womb, right? Um, you rejoiced in your mother's womb when you heard of me. And it's, don't you think it's a little too late for you to kind of have this doubt? <laughs> you know, uh, those are all the questions that run in my head, uh, not necessarily John's. But, um, but again, of all the things that Jesus could have pointed out, Jesus just pauses and he says, very simply, like a boss, he says, the blind see, the lame walk, the dead are raised. He points to the works that he is doing, which is the works of the Father. Right. Okay. So, um, I mean, it, it's quite amazing so far of, of just Jesus' intention, his heart, the, in, the importance that Jesus gave for miracles. In chapter one, we very briefly see the importance that Jesus gave to miracles, the way he talks about it. Right. Time and time again. Um, okay. So um, let's move on. Are you guys with me? Are you all right? I'm going to walk by faith and believe that you guys are going to go all right. The next section talks about, um, it's highlighted as, I must do the Father's work. I must do the Father's work. Uh, can I request uh, some, uh, any one of us to just read the passage that you're seeing on the screen, John chapter 9, verse 1 to 7. It's the passage that uh, you have seen on the screen. You don't mind. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated, Sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Thank you, John. Okay. So uh, we see that when the Lord Jesus saw a man born blind, sick, diseased, and so on, he saw it as an occasion for the works of the Father to be revealed in that person. Right? For the work of the Father to be revealed in that person. Right? I must, so verse 4, it says, I must work. The works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Okay. Um, so he saw this, he saw it as an occasion for the works of the Father to be revealed in that person. Not that God made him blind, but that God, through healing this man's blindness, would reveal his works. Okay. Um, so Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me. In other words, I must do the Father's works. And, it is, and clearly, it was the Father's work to make blind men see. It is the Father's work to heal and make whole, not to wound or make sick. Okay. Um, hey, guys, uh, someone is at the door and no one's at home. Can, can you excuse me for like two minutes? I just go quickly. Okay. 
I'm so sorry about this, guys. Just give me a minute, please. Thank you. So sorry, guys. Okay, where was I? Where was I? All right. So, uh, you know, it, it says Jesus. In other words, he says, "I must do the works of the Father." Okay, you know, when he said, "I must work the works of Him who sent me," the Father sent him. That's what he's implying. Okay? And here's the thing: right? we must seize the opportune moment to do the Father's works now while it is day. Okay? When God speaks, acts on it. Right? But we still have our time here on earth. Right? There is going to be a time uh, when we are all going to be taken up. Right? And there won't be a need for miracles or healing in heaven. But then, why we are here on earth with the same assignment that Jesus was on, we've got to make use of every opportunity to pray for the sick, right? to display the love of the Father, to reveal the heart of the Father. Right? Because uh, we are in this orphan world that has not encountered or really tasted the true love of the Father. And a lot of people, in fact, can get offended by the fact that when we say, when we use the title Father, for God, because I'm sure a lot of people out there know that they, they have bad experiences with their fathers. So for them, the father figure means it's not good. Like, you know, if he's, I've had an abusive father all my life. I, I don't relate with that, you know, good father. I don't understand it and whatnot. And so that's the kind of world that we are living, living in. And, and we got to make every May it kind of count in revealing the true Father. Okay, uh, so let's move on. Um, and this is uh, this section talks uh, is just supporting uh, um, the statement Jesus made uh, prior to this. And when we you know when we see that Jesus points to his miracles, signs, and wonders, the works that he is doing that bears witness, which is greater than the witness of John the Baptist. Right. So here are a couple of scriptures. It says, John chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. I mean, can you hear their, I can almost hear their mind voice. And Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. John 10, 37, 38. If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Amen. Um, right. Some of these people have had enough. He's like, hey, Please, you know, beat around the bush or, you know, talk to us in riddles, um, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> it's like, wake you up, just tell us plainly who you are, you know. Uh, how long do you keep us in doubt? What's happening? You know, we need to know. We got to know, right? It's like you want to surprise someone and the person is kind of running out of patience. Just tell me where we are going. Okay, right? uh, we've been there, but yeah. That's amazing. You know, when the Jewish people came to Jesus and asked him a direct question about him being the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus responded, pointing to the Father's work as proof of him being the Messiah. We already saw that, right? 
And then he then went on to make the strong statement in verse 37, in John chapter 10, verse 37, saying, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. Wow. Right? What if we laid such emphasis on doing the father's work as Jesus did? I mean, what if we told people that if we do not do the father's work, do not believe what we preach. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's right in the face, isn't it? Right? If, if, we do not, if we do not do the Father's work, do not believe what we preach. Um, this is how important doing the Father's works was to Jesus. It was more important than what he preached. He essentially stated, even if you do not believe what I say, at least believe the works. Uh, wow. You know, it's more. <laughs> if Jesus is saying, you know, my message is not that important, you know, it's not more important than the works that I do. I mean, just think about it. Okay, Sermon on the Mount is one of the things that comes to my mind right now. Right, That's his message of isn't it? And then he goes on to make the statement, like, even if you do not believe what I say, at least believe the works. <laughs> um, so the, all because the works I do bear witness of me. Right? That's what Jesus said, isn't it? Uh, it works greater witness than John the Baptist. Right? Um, and most scriptures, believe me for the sake of the works. Okay? Um, Okay, I'm going to request two of us to read this scripture. Um, this one of you can read from uh, verse 1 to verse 7, and another person from 8 to 13, please. If you just read the scripture, go ahead. Who do we have? Let's see. All right, uh, Sid, would you like to go ahead and read verse one to seven, please? And then tell it all you in verse eight to thirteen after. John chapter fourteen, verses one to seven. <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And if, I go, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and <clears throat> where you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, <clears throat> you know him and have been have seen him thank you okay Philip said to him Lord show us the father uh, and it's sufficient for us Jesus have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me Philip he who has seen me has seen the father so you say, show us the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe that I, I am in the Father 
and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that do, he will do also, and greater works than this he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified the Son. Amen. Thank you, Zelito. Um, right, so in, in just this from verse 1 to between verse 1 and 13, there are so many well-known popular scriptures, right? Uh, you, you, you see framed and, you know, in houses like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, just one verse, or... Um, there's so many scriptures right there in between this, isn't it? Uh, you know, I'm, that's, that's one of the things, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and so many other things. But it, it adds a certain different beauty to it when you read the whole thing in, in its context, isn't it? Um, you know, Jesus is talking, um, you know, about that uh, he's preparing his disciples about his departure, that he's going to be gone, and then, uh, you know, they raise these questions like, okay, where are you going? How do we know where you're going? And who is your father? Can we see your father? Uh, Lord of nowhere, so Lord, show us the father. It is sufficient for us, you know. Um, and then in all of this context, we see in verse 11, believe me that I am in the father and the father in me. Or... Believe me, once again, for the sake of the works themselves. Again, Jesus pointing to the works that he's done so far. Right? Okay, so if, you, if you're not believing, not able to believe what I say, uh, all of this, at least look what I've done. Right? Like the old song that says, look what the Lord has done. Right? He's healed my body. Right? Um, most assuredly, verse 12, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. So it is, once again, in this context, we see this popular verse come, coming to life, isn't it? I say to you, that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Amen? Um, so, uh, so the title of the section is Believe Me for the Sake of the Works. Right? Um, so it's, it's summarized here that there was a time he was preparing his disciples for his de departure. He began to speak to them about his father's house and mansions. He would prepare for, uh, that he would build for his disciples. And Philip requested to see the father. Jesus responded saying, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. He then challenged his own disciples Believe that I am in the Father and Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Right? He's basically saying, take my word for this, or else if you cannot take my word, believe what I am saying, because you see the work I am doing. Right? So to his own disciples, finally. So he had to... Uh, he, he had to tell John the Baptist about who he is, the Jews about who questioned him about who he is, and finally to his own disciples, Jesus points to the Father's works, um, the healings, miracles, and signs and wonders as the Father's works, as proof and evidence. Okay. Um, so, this next. so Jesus, uh, you know, we're going to look, look at uh, the intimate walk uh, between Jesus and the Father. In John chapter 1, verse 18, it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Okay, You might be reading a lot of this passage, this scripture in particular, in, even in Christology. Um, and no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Okay, so how did Jesus walk with the Father? Uh, how was his relationship with the Father? Okay, that's what we're going to learn as well. So, to be in the bosom simply means to be the intimate presence. In that, okay, so that's from the Amplified Version. So the Lord Jesus walked in the intimate presence of the Father. 
right? And time and time again, we see from these scriptures, um, which I'll just go ahead and share with us as well. Those are all the scriptures for your references uh, in the chat section. You'll be able to read them. Uh, Matthew 14, 23, uh, says, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. Mark 1, 35, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And then he prayed. So he himself, Luke 5, 16, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Luke 6, 12, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Time and time again in the scriptures, we see that Jesus would just go to a solitary place. He would wake up early in the morning and just spend time with God in prayer. Right? And that was the foundation of his intimate walk with the Father. And it, just because of all of that, he was able to say in John chapter 10, verse 15, as the Father knows me, even so, I know the Father. Okay, the, in the, the word know in Greek that's used there is intimacy. Right? It's the same word that is used uh, when it talks about Joseph and Mary. It says that when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, during the time of pregnancy, it says Joseph did not know her. Right? It's the language of intimacy that is being used there. Right? So, and here in this... The same passage, which is John 1, 18, here in the Amplified Version, says, says like this, He has revealed him and brought him out where he can be seen. He has interpreted him and he has made him known. It's talking about Jesus and how he revealed the Father. Right? Um, so I just want to pause here because we're going to be... Uh, we, Going, be going for a break, but um, you know, as a parent or as a father, and you will understand this. Uh, you know, you've known your child from the time that child was conceived, right, in the mother's womb. Uh, I remember my son from the time he was like a dot in my, you know, in the womb, and I know him. But suddenly, the world kind of changes uh, to you. It becomes so different when the child begins to recognize and understand who you really are to them, right? Uh, your world changes when your child knows that, you know, you are her or his father, right? Uh, I'm sure some of our parents, some of us parents can relate to that. But it, it's it's... It's the same thing with, with, you know, with Jesus and the Father, isn't it? The relationship between them is for Jesus to say that I know the Father. Right? It's not just saying the Father knows me. Of course, the Father knows us. Right? He knit us together in our mother's womb. But do we know our Father? Um, so with that, I'll just pause um, and we'll go for a 10-minute break. And we'll be back for our next session. All right. Have a good one. 